been out there right now. It might help if I plug my mic in, but anyway. <laughs> well, audiences, and I'll even include myself here, eat these stories up. On the other end of them are families that live these gruesome realities, and seeing that play out for the world is not always easy. And for some, the idea of reliving their most traumatic days is too much to bear. Others can't stomach the idea of their Anyway, I'm going to get started now. Join in if you feel like, ask over questions, over the usually always happy to answer, helps me, helps you, helps me. For many, it's all of the above, which is actually why we spoke to Mariah Day, whose family story was told in a miniseries called The Thing About Pam on NBC, produced by and starring Renee Zellweger. Mariah's mother, Betsy Faria, was suffering from cancer when she was found stabbed dozens of times in December of 2011. Betsy's husband, Russ, was originally charged over the murder and later convicted with the leading witness in the case being Betsy's friend, Pam Tuck. All the while, though, following Betsy's death, Pam was actually the beneficiary of Betsy's $150,000 life insurance policy. And so Russ's conviction was later overturned in 2015, and Pop was charged over Betsy's death in 2021 and is still awaiting trial. But also, notably, she's actually already serving a life sentence over the murder of Louis Dumpenberger, which, interestingly, is the punishment that she got after entering an Alfred plea, which allowed her to avoid the potential death penalty without admitting guilt to the crime. And so the story is laid out in The Thing About Pam, which aired over the spring and is now streaming. Zellweger plays Huff, hamming the role up via prosthetics and aggressive quirks. And the story overall has been described as taking something of a comedic twist on the case and the alleged misconduct that led to Huff being initially ignored as a suspect. Sorry, I am such a sweaty baby. Betsy's daughter Mariah has only been able to watch a handful of episodes after feeling shocked by the tone and tactics used to tell the story of the worst days of her life. We live this, and it's just so weird to see them play our real lives in such a tragedy, in such a satire way. Like, we, it's not funny to us. And according to Mariah, when she was first approached by NBC about the show, she was under the impression that the network was making a documentary, not a scripted series about her mother's death. And so she said she agreed to sit down for an interview to discuss her story, but only learned it would be a fictionalized version of the incident once she saw the trailer. And so in the lead-up to the series, Mariah began posting several TikToks about the show and how she found it insensitive. Some of those posts also going viral, with many responding by supporting Mariah and her message about why it's so important for true crime storytelling to be ethical. Some having the same issues with the thing about Pam as she did. I've had so many people reach out and say it was completely disrespectful. I had to turn it off as soon as I saw the tone of the show without even, like, knowing me or my family. With some critics also agreeing, The Independent calling the series a lesson in how to not make a true crime series, writing that little felt true about the crime presented and adding that when it comes to the tacky exploitive depths of true crime, let's hope we finally hit the bottom of the barrel. Now with all this, we saw NBC previously defending the series in a statement to BuzzFeed News saying, The thing about Pam is a fictionalized television series based on true events that are heavily documented and in public domain. Since the inception of the project, it has been a top priority of the creative team to honor the spirit of the story while also treating the real people impact, many of whom shared their experiences as part of this process with sensitivity and respect. But Mariah hardly feels that this story was told sensitively. They really focus on the killer. Um, they kind of glorify her in a way by showing her like this quirky, um, quirky lady who um, had an, everyone manipulated when like it wasn't completely like that, being like so close to it. Um, I mean, they show her consoling me which never happens. I've never had a conversation with Pam Huff, so it's really weird to see my mom's killer portraying or my mom's killer on TV pulling us when that never really happened. She's not alone in finding it difficult to watch her family's true crime story play out in a sensationalized way. For example, when Jordan Preston learned that Hulu was making a documentary about the man who killed her sister Brooke, she made a change.org petition to stop the release of it and write it. He clearly will never be given the opportunity to grieve in peace from her brutal murder to the drawn out trial to the appeals still taking place. Now to this, that much is apparent. Also, you have people like Mindy Pendleton, whose stepson Robert was murdered at the age of 25, telling Time Magazine that it was her greatest fear when Netflix said that the incident would be featured in a true crime docuseries, and saying that she actually begged Netflix to not do it. And Mariah knows that as if living through these tragedies wasn't hard enough, having them reemerge as forms of entertainment only re-traumatizes those involved. I definitely struggle with mental health, but I get strength from my mom. And if I was any weaker than that could have I mean it's it's been really hard um I mean I had PTSD from the trials and everything and I mean anyone any normal person would not be able to make it through this it's a very difficult process and they just kind of um 
entertainment. However, with all this, Mariah does think that things are changing when it comes to how true crime is both perceived and told. After attending a true crime podcast festival, she said that she was met with support from those attending, with many saying that they want to see a shift to focus on the victims, not the killers. Mariah thinks that this will make a world of difference in the genre. That's the main reason why I continue to speak out is because I've had so many people tell me that um, just hearing what I went through and just me being vocal about it all has really changed their perspective on the way they either view true, true crime or if they're creators of true crime, they actually think more of the victim's families, and I just want people to be able to put themselves in our shoes. But adding that to tell ethical true crime, the victim's life and story needs to be a bigger part of the picture. I mean, it's okay to be fascinated with, like, the psychology behind it all, but people just get so into, um, like, the killer's story, and we just hear the killer's name everywhere where everyone forgets about the victim. The victims had a story, too. You know, this story for us, this may live in your mind for minutes, hours, days, even months, maybe. But for Mariah, her story still isn't even over because Pam still hasn't gone to trial, meaning that the wounds are still open and fresh. And she may even have to relocate during the trial because it's gotten so much attention. And then, with the NFL season starting up, concerts in full swing, and the MLB playoffs right around the corner, there is an event for everyone, and you're not going to want to miss out. Which is why I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, SeatGeek. Whether it's concerts, football, Ball, baseball, theater, or more, SeatGeek puts tickets from all over the web in one place to make buying simple. Use it all the time. I'm looking for something to do. Boom. Comedy show when I was in New York. I went to a Rangers game out here. I went to the Super Bowl. SeatGeek is my go-to. But SeatGeek wants to make sure that you're getting a good deal. So when you're on the app, look for the green dots. Green means good deal. Red means bad. And I've got the hookup for you because if you use code Phil, you get $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. It's $20 off your first purchase with promo code Phil. So make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. Then a very exciting and quick announcement. Next month, Monday, I am launching the biggest drop we've done in a very long time over at beautifulbasket.com. It features all of this goodness and stretch it out. Feel free to pause and eye what you want to snag because there are going to be a few things that are just very limited. So yeah, get ready to snag what you want while you can. Disaster has been averted possibly, probably. So most of us probably haven't been aware until recently that for the past two years, there's been a labor contract struggle happening between six of the largest freight carriers and 12 railroad workers unions. And last July, oh. Biden appointed an emergency Cheers, board sleepy. to mediate this dispute. And since then, its recommendations have produced oh, an doing agreement soon or added to the crunches on the messages for the ad work out later. Bring it back into negotiation. And so leaving two unions representing almost 60,000 conductors and engineers for without a deal. And there's demands work. concern typical issues like pay and working conditions, but also it primarily centered around a points-based attendance policy adopted by some railroads earlier this year. A policy that penalized workers for missing work and even firing them for taking off to see the doctor or attending family emergencies. With workers saying that they can be on call for 14 consecutive days without a break and that they don't get any sick days at all, paid or unpaid. With the president of one union saying, the average American would not know that we get fired for going to the doctor. This one thing has our members most enraged. We have guys who were punished for taking time off for a heart attack in COVID. It's inhumane. But also, even before the points-based system, they were on call pretty much constantly and if you got called in, you had to show up within 90 minutes to two hours. And so with all of this, we saw the unions threaten to strike with a deadline to reach a deal being midnight tonight. And if that were to happen, I, I don't think the word catastrophic is too heavy. It would be the first time the United States has seen a railroad strike in decades. It would shut down nearly a third of the U.S.'s freight, according to industry players, and costing an estimated $2 billion per day. But also, beneath those numbers are a bunch of more specific impacts that are incredibly up. Here you had Amtrak announcing the suspension of all long-distance trains and some state-supported trains starting Thursday. This, even though none of its workers were threatening a strike, because it still uses track that's owned, maintained, and dispatched by freight railroads. Plus, freight tracks also serve commuter lines between major cities and suburbs, so passenger trains could be shut down, leaving many people with no quick routes to work. And it's not just like a little bit. About half of commuter rail systems run on track or right-of-ways at least partially owned by freight. But then more directly hitting the economy where it hurts, you have freight railways being critical for retailers to transport inventory from ports to warehouses and distribution centers. And so this stoppage, I mean, you're talking about supply chains getting completely shut down, which as many of you know is one of the big factors when you're talking about inflation. It could also affect the availability of supplies like food and health equipment. And frighteningly, in more places than just Jackson, Mississippi, the strike could disrupt the delivery of coal to utility plants and chlorine to water treatment facilities, just fucking up people's way of life, which is why we've senior White House aides talking to top officials in the shipping, freight, and logistics industries to figure out how highways, ports, and waterways could be used to offset any damage, as well as holding daily meetings with the Agriculture Department, Transportation Department, Energy Department, and other federal agencies to brace for impact, with Labor Secretary Marty Wallace holding emergency meetings between unions and management starting yesterday morning and then continuing for 20 straight hours all through last night, trying to rock through it like me trying to learn calculus in a night for the final in college, except for the people involved here, uh, it's not.
not an F that you're risking. It's more uh, America's economy on the line. It appears to have resulted in the first bit of good news with this story. Biden announced that the two sides finally reached a tentative agreement, effectively diffusing the crisis, or at the very least, postponing it. Because the key word here is tentative. An official deal has to be ratified in the coming weeks. That'll require union members to vote for it, and until then, they have agreed to not strike. But we have to wait to see if they approve what their leadership presents to them. As far as some of the specifics in this agreement, there's a 24% increase in wages for the five years from 2020 to 2024, as well as an immediate payout of some 11000 on average dollars when it's ratified. New contracts also include one additional paid day off and the ability to attend medical appointments without penalty, which is insane to think that they even have to fight for that. Plus, the agreement will freeze workers' monthly health care contributions, ensuring that those costs will not increase during the next round of contract negotiations. And even with all this, there are more details coming, but uh, this is a huge deal for pretty much everyone, for the country, for the workers involved here, but also I think it's important to remember like how integral the hard labor of so many unrecognized Americans is for all of our lives to just function on a basic level. Chief Florida man Ron DeSantis back in the news. That's because the governor of Florida decided to ship a group of 50 or so illegal migrants from his state to Martha's Vineyard. And in a statement his office said, Florida can confirm the two planes with illegal immigrants that arrived in Martha's Vineyard today were part of the state's relocation program to transport illegal immigrants to sanctuary destinations. And adding that I believe that's states such as Massachusetts, New York, and California were better equipped to handle migrants. So here we saw this small city quickly scrambling to take care of the new arrivals, with local officials tweeting out, due to an unexpected urgent humanitarian situation, emergency services are opening emergency shelters tonight on Martha's Vineyard. If you're willing and able to volunteer in a clinical or non-clinical role, contact Duke's office. And with that, we saw a number of conservatives bashing the city, claiming that it doesn't really stand by its liberal views on immigration. You know, this isn't really an isolated incident. This is actually just one of a series of stunts we've seen pulled by Republican governors. Or you've seen Texas Governor Greg Abbott shipping people off to New York, as well as shipping out 101 migrants, mostly from Venezuela to D.C. today, dropping them off in front of one of the vice president's residences. For Republicans, these stunts appear to be meant to show that it's easy for liberal states to block border measures on high-minded ideals when they often aren't the ones who actually have to deal with illegal immigration. But also, going back to Martha's Vineyard, characterization that the, the city freaked out about the surprise influx of people does appear to be a little off. Instead, it seems to have actually taken the situation in stride and received a lot of praise for coming together to help the migrants rather than be put off by them. And also, you know, the overall criticism that liberal cities are, are hypocritical for declaring a state of emergency, that appears to be somewhat disingenuous because it often unlocks funds to quickly set up responses. And regarding the, the mockery of calling this a humanitarian crisis, we're talking about a group of people that were forced onto a plane or a bus and shipped across the country without knowing where they were going and being treated as pawns. And even when, you know, we have people being transported voluntarily, such as when Abbott does it, it's reported that Republican officials often refuse to work with local officials to make the transfer as smooth as possible. But then, once again, so we don't get confused, when it came to DeSantis, he reportedly didn't work with DHS or INS. And then somehow you're going to tout it as a win when those migrants are actually met with compassion and help. But hey, for now, that is where we are. We're going to have to see how this, this situation and these stunts continue to develop. Uh, but that is the end of this story and today's show. As always, thank you for watching and being subscribed to the Daily Dimes and the News. We've got some more news that you should know about right here. But as always, my name is Philip Franco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you tomorrow. watch that Squatties game where Buddy Franklin scored his thousandth goal? It was an incredible moment. Everyone poured onto the field in celebration, commemorating a feat that'll probably never be achieved again in the great game of Australian rules, but in a different game, for a different player. A thousand goals is nothing. Impossible is nothing. In fact, this player is such a gun that he's about to score his 5,000 goal hits. Just that they're all through his own posts, okay? But nonetheless, I'm tuned in. Oh, he's gonna do it! He's gonna kick his 5,000th, ladies and gentlemen! John the Stallion Barilaro! Um, I'm thinking of giving this flying car company a million dollars. He's done it! He's done it again! It was always just an expression that those at the top of their field defy gravity until today! Just like the Jetson Stooge! Jetsons have arrived from Haramite and away. That's for those older ones in the crowd that don't remember the Jetsons as a cartoon about flying cars. $950,000 to see for the very first time 
uh, a precinct, a tenant, someone in the space of where we're looking at buying cars. And that's the easiest way to, to say it. Yes, you thought I was joking. Perhaps the funniest use of your taxpayer dollars bar, baby. I don't know. John Barillaro's bushfire recovery grant going to a skydiving adventure park. Yeah, because bruds, hear me out. Like, you see a big ass bushfire coming your way. Oh, what you gonna do? Oh, that's right. Your boy John Barillaro invented the flying cars. You get out one of those sick from this. You fly away, skydive out of that you. shit, land in the adventure park where there's a bunch of hot and media advisors waiting to do this and that, not admitting to anything here. Friend wouldn't ask, a gentleman wouldn't tell. Holistic governing, you dumb bitches. Ten years! He was in for ten years and he ran the government like a 13 year old and no one said shit for a decade. He never thought was in that chair. Him, that bushfire recovery grant should go to, I don't know, toilets for firefighters. No, you just piss behind a tree. Or if there's a fire, piss on it to put it out. Or, even more sexy, piss on it from your flying car. Yeah. He's just sunbathing in the other room at the moment. See, this is the kind of blightening hustle mentality uh, you're missing out on. Give it a bit of time, he might come in later. For it as your job. You know who else didn't have a degree? John Cena. Are you sure about that? He's actually that much of a debater. Matt Riddle, you are a dick. How's your weekend, by the way, eh? I've yet to receive the bill. A friend of ours paid it all, but they'll be telling us how much we're going to pay each later. Which brings me to the main point of this video, which is if there's any. Very well worth it. Very well worth it. Is that you Pate, stale. Politics. Um, action out of video. You just can't take him out of politics. Something tasted like a deconstructed hamburger as well. It was really nice. It was like a steak tartare. But like these little tiny French fries. Such as the fallout from the other job we got. Making the main was a chicken, which is really good. I got I make it I make it sound way too simple than what it is. I definitely don't give it justice by the way I'm describing it. But I definitely enjoyed every bit of it. But not the fucking mafia! It's a fucking disgusting slur! Yeah, boy, someone ought to get in Kaku shoes. Maybe they should, West Bay. Maybe they should. Pretty good legacy already. But in the far off distant future of 2026. What will Australia look back on in gratitude to? Yeah, sure, the Deputy Premier of New South Wales, but I think we could all agree, the chief hustler of the world, John Barillaro. First, shoot me, Lord Dutch, the snowy mansion. Frank, how are you going, buddy? What's going on? What time is it? Uh, Ted, you guys still in the accommodation, are you? How dare you? Right up there how dare you? you? Cena, George Cleveland, a bunch of bands. Far gayer state, sure. But sexy, nonetheless. And finally, the honest chippy from Cleveland saw Harry Potter 2 and... How are you guys going anyway? Did you guys get up to after we left yesterday? Think there's a dream of you with huge... No, serious. There's a doctor. I seriously quoted flying cars in New South Wales. I just went sick. Accrediting a grant for chippy chippy bright bright here. And being one of the main drivers. Sorry. My factors in making the dream a reality. A draft of the future transport strategy has been leaked. This is with Eva Gold, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft technology to provide fast and affordable point to point and on demand connectivity to regional hubs and potentially capital cities. Where is this government going to get the train? Still train. The New South Wales government is partnering with Australian Easter Coal, a startup business to help develop an Easter Coal aircraft capable of providing fast, low cost and emission free air ambulance and passenger point to point services to regional New South Wales. Through the New South Wales government's regional investment attraction mm. fund, we have awarded a 950,000 for the construction of a testing facility in Narromine Airport. Where developmental test flights will be conducted with a goal of having a certified aircraft capable of commencing operations by 2026. <laughs> Australia's funny. On the federal level, the coalition were campaigning on electric cars being impractical, whilst their state counterparts gave a startup, supposedly out in Narromine, Australia's Silicon Valley, 
a million taxpayer dollars going, yep, that'll do it. Flying electric cars by 2026. State of a business. Oh, the shit John made them go along with because he possesses the superpower of throwing a two-year-old tantrum as a 50-year-old man. Third world level land clearing, build flying cars. Guys, Blade Runner 2049 is just 29 years away. If we want to get with the timeline, we have to get with the program. And look, before you can pan me to that old New York Times article that said it would take 10 million years to develop aeroplanes, I'm sure Barillaro, along with being the next Mike Tyson, but replaced here by the with licking, is also a one-man drive for us. You know, I'm not denying that these cars could probably fly by then, and this company may very well be doing a bang-up job on that. That's not the point here. I mean, you could probably buy a Kmart drone, sit on it and fly anywhere nowadays. In fact, hasn't Casey Neistat already done that? What I do doubt is that the government that can't get the trains to run, bought trains that crack, trains that have cameras that don't recognise anything under 1.1 metres, trains that can't go through tunnels, ferries that can't go under bridges, ferries that can't operate at night, will have a flying car commencing operation in four years. Yeah, but cuz, if you had the flying cars, none of those would be obstacles. You just, woohoo! I mean, Jesus, just look at the news recently. Every day it's just New South Wales Transport Minister David Elliott hyperventilating about the RTBU, the Rail, Tram and Bus Union. Imagine if you had a system of flying cars and David Elliott had to deal with that. That would be as in the flying union of cars and trains. I'm even sympathetic to the idea of the government helping develop new transport technologies, but it doesn't exactly give you confidence when every minister, when asked by Labor in budget estimates about this flying car idea, have the same response they have when asked about any other aspect of Brothers' legacy. They distance themselves and joke about it. Watch this. This is David Elliott's response to questions from Labor gun John Graham. Look at this. Given the problems that the government's having with the trains, with the trams, with the ferries, hmm. given the tolls on the roads, why is your government's future transport strategy promising flying cars in the next term of parliament? Well, uh, John, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. Just because we've got challenges today doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking at the opportunities You're backing this in, can flying cars in, in right. the next term of parliament <laughs> as your draft future transport. Sorry. You're backing this in. No, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm sorry, because what are be futuristic? You wouldn't have electric ferries if you didn't think about... Um, so despite the fact that CAFTA won't regulate this for years afterwards, you're promising well, maybe, in your may, future maybe transport if, strategy... Maybe if, John, this, this matter is brought forward, well, then CAFTA might review it earlier, but um, so I'll have to put any questions about flying cars Not on your notice. department? On notice. Will, will they fly from Parramatta to Wentworth Point? Is that the first? Are we, are we looking at that as an option? Now you're being silly, Daniel. Will they fly well, you to your meetings with Alex Clarkson? To be fair, in Rush, maybe you're going to be like the DeLorean and go back stop, in time. Stop, How much was the amount of money, John? Six million dollars. Oh, yeah, Nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's what a good. That's nearly as much money as what the RTBU gave the Labor Party last year. Oh, that's a good way to win. I gotta say though, that clip was awesome. It was like the budget estimates just turned into your favourite podcast. Three dudes just straight vibing. And if you thought David Elliott's clip was awesome, well, he's just done something even better. You think this government doesn't follow procedure and listen to criticism? After being humiliated by Labor in the estimates, the New South Wales Liberals updated their targets from 2026 to 2030. Still on time for the timeline, Stooge. I know this is just been 10 minutes of us commenting on John's performance in public office, but to sign off, we've been looking at this photo and laughing at it for hours, because we had to, but look at it. Without <laughs> much further ado, I think you is this a car for ants the flying car has to be at least three times bigger than this if you can think of a better caption write it in the comments 
John Barillaro capturing contest. Any picture of him ever in relation to his time in public office. Write something down, send it through our Facebook messages, and we'll read them out. We'll do a whole video on it. There's just too many of them. On this one video, we had all of these ideas and more. As you can see, we're already up to the animal testing phase. We're gonna get like a little hamster and put one of those old-timey aeroplane hats on him and put him in there. Or we can take the bruz moose, pop in. But sir, I said pop in. Or, and they said it wouldn't be ready by 2026. Look. It flies and shrinks, just like the magic school bus. Or, oh, do you think the boys on Grand Tour will review this shit? My favorite's James May. No, no, Richard Hammond. Richard Hammond, yeah, he's sick. Or, oh, bro, you could go so fast up there and, like, you'd never lose your license like I did down here. No, because there'd be other cars up there, John. No, just make one for me. No. No, I paid for it. You just make one and I'll give you licks. Or, oi, what would you do if someone jammed that up your ass? Oh, it did hurt heaps, hey. <laughs> oh, is the air like international waters and you can like smoke cunts up there and fuck bitches? Or, oh, you said that it looked like the Jetsons. This is just a gay helicopter. Or, Spanion's catchphrase from his Microsoft Flight Simulator series. This is probably way too much of a deep cut because it wasn't his most popular series, but I loved it. Yeah, look at that ending layout now. Like a glove. Anyway, that was the short list of our suggestions. What are yours? Write them in the comments. And the best one, here's a prize. We might actually do a whole video on it, just remember that, but the guaranteed prize, pinned comment. Mm -hmm. Runners up, love heart. The desperate YouTubers that are getting ratioed put on the positive comments to try and boost them up on the algorithm. But we'll just be giving them away because John's put us in a really good mood. Like and subscribe. Time to go skydiving, Stooge! It's a funny cup there. <laughs> Please share and comment below. That's it, Aim. Thanks for joining. I'm assuming it's still the weekend where you are. It's Monday where I am. Well, thanks for the 20 crunches as well, Sleepy. As usual, keeping me on my toes, well, on my ass, I guess. I'll add that to the other 20, so that's another 40. Thank you. Saying that, and that's 60 crunches. After I turn on a distraction. Burr, B U R R, uh, Zip Recruiter. The smartest way to hire. Oh, look who it is, everybody. It's Helix. Helix? H-E-L-I-X. You know, nothing is better than a good night's sleep. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. So... How will you know which Helix mattress works best for your body? Take the Helix sleep quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. And your personalized mattress is shipped straight to your door free of charge. Helix knows there's no better way to test out a new mattress than finding somebody you dig, put them on, and fucking bang it. No. Uh, mattress them by sleeping on it in your own home. That's why they offer 100 night risk-free trial plus helix mattresses are an american made the american made and come with a 10 to 15 year warranty depending on the model and remember you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free if you don't love it i know you will but if you don't love it they'll pick it up for your gross and give you a full refund another 40 to go reach into my hazmat pocket <laughs> and get your refund uh don't want to take my word for it well helix has been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired magazine. Who knew Cokeheads had a magazine? It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors for sleep, a sleep machine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash burr. With Helix, better sleep starts now. 
All right, lastly, but not leastly, look who it is, everybody. It's old stamps.com. You know, if you're a small business owner, you know how important it is to be ready for the insane holiday season. If you haven't started preparing for the chaos of holiday, oh my God, we got to start shopping here. Holiday mailing and shipping, you're already falling behind. I like this, causing stress, making me feel like I'm, 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 I'm behind. Luckily, Stamps.com has made everything you need, oh, has everything you need to make your life a whole lot easier. You've heard me talk about Stamps.com. They've been sponsoring for this and wonderful show for nine years. And the parents. And if you haven't tried it yet, what are you waiting for? Stamps.com is one of your top shops, uh, your one-stop shop, sorry, for all your shipping and mailing needs. A stress-free solution for every small business. Use stamps.com to print postage where, uh, whenever you, wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. And if you need to package, pick up, you can easily schedule it through your stamps.com dashboard. Get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Get started with stamps.com today. Oh, yeah. Get out, shop, and then ship it out. And then you can sit around getting hammered as everybody else runs out to Amazon. Nobody really runs out to the mall anymore, do they? Sign up with promo code BURR for a special offer. That includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free Still digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com. Click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code BURR. B-U-R-R. -R. All right. And with that, let's keep talking here. Let's keep yapping like the two cute old ladies on my flight. Good Lord, there's these two adorable old ladies in front of me, and about with a third of the flight left, they started talking to each other. You know, they're talking over a, a jet, and they're all so old, so they can't hear each other. They're just like, what? <laughs> it was hilarious and also really annoying, so I put on my, my, my fucking headphones. I had, to put on, I had to go with ACDC to try and drown them out. Um, but anyway... I had a really good day, and I'm thankful for it. And I'm also thankful for the fact that I had a bunch of wonderful people helping me work on this movie, and we're almost done with it. We uh, we shot a couple of scenes, one added scene, and we reshot another scene and on Monday. And I just had such a fucking great time. And as much as I've been bitching about all this work, I know I'm going to do this again because it's fun. And we all had a great time. And uh, I think you guys are going to like this movie when we're done with it. I'm excited. It's getting close. It's getting close. And uh, like I've been saying, when this movie comes out, I need to, I'm calling in a favor to all the use uh, to go out wherever, you, wherever you're going to be able to see it. Um, I would appreciate it if you could support it. If you can't, I get it. People are busy, but I'd appreciate it. All right. Well, that is the podcast, everybody. Um, who do you like? Who do you like? The Chargers are playing. Uh, who the fuck are they playing tomorrow night? I can't even remember. I'm going to be doing a show. I'm going to have my wife take the game. Where is this of most Okay, cool. There's uh, football. Cricket is actually number two, weirdly enough. Uh, it's insanely popular in India. Yeah. Uh, football is uh, actually that's soccer. It's I mean uh, football is in the traditional yeah. way where it's actually no football. Cricket, hockey, tennis, volleyball, table tennis, basketball, baseball, rugby, and then golf, which admittedly is higher listed than American football. <laughs> <laughs> which we've talked about in two episodes now, which is just shoes of favoritism of this man in front no, of me right what here. Was fantasy. The fantasy what? It was make believe. You even call it football and not American football like the heathen you are. It should be fantasy American football. It should be F A S. Yeah, it should all be that. There are four billion fans of football, soccer football, out there in the world. Table tennis has more fans. That's impressive. Rugby is more popular than American football. Oh, what do you know that? I'm well, learning so much at all. Well, I'm because in so the general much. sense of the world, most people don't pay attention to a sport that's only really played in the United States. Interesting. You know, this is actually saying that cricket is more popular. This other article is more popular than soccer, but I don't believe that. Well, if it's it'd be interesting because um, cricket, I believe, is the most popular sport in India. Mm, I 
nice, 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 nice. Um, but it is quite popular in the UK as well. Yeah, but golf is up there almost universally. So I will give it to you. This is uh, definitely a long time coming. We're here to talk about golf. Let me tell you what I know about golf. Stick, ball, green, sand, traps, pole, flag, hats, Arnold Palmer, shoes with spikes on them, long pants or shorts, polo, love, golf. Nice. Caddy, uh, big bucket, more sticks, cart. Uh, so uh, eco-terrorism, uh, waste of resources, um, completely excessive amount of space for the amount of people playing on it. Um, really provides a solid wall of inequality between those that have and have not. Country clubs, elitist status, business meetings, dirty dealings. Body not dirty dealings. dealings, not always dirty. Sometimes dirty dealings, sometimes dirty. Sometimes dirty. Sometimes they're dirty. I don't know it's dirty. Maybe they're in the sand trap in the bunker, rolling around having a meeting. <laughs> Sexual harassment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give me, give me, give me golf. Give me golf. I'm ready. That's what I know. How does it stack up against what you know? Well, I actually was going to ask you that question, but I believe Amy is quite the golfer, if I remember right. And um, making a lot of assumptions. Uh, especially considering all the negative things I just said about golf. <laughs> you go, hey, Amy, how dare you? How dare yeah. you? Amy's a wonderful person. That's on the plan. Uh-huh. But, she, but a golfer. That doesn't mean a bad thing. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Plays golf. <laughs> all right, whatever. No, but we did top golf at Wade's bachelor party before his wedding. Uh-huh. And um, when I first moved out here, obviously, like, we were talking about golf and different sports and different stuff like that because I believe you guys had just gone to the Dodgers game. Mm-hmm. And you were like, Amy's really good at golf. And that's that's as much as I know. You, so you don't you should not believe anything that I exclaim in that tone of voice. You should. It, I just explained all of the things I know about golf in that same tone. Do you do you oh, trust right. me as a person of authority but about this, Mark? You're my friend. You'd never lead me astray. You'd never lie to me. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Uh, there's a lot to unpack for this episode. No, but uh, did you oh. enjoy Top Golf when we played Top Golf? It's yeah, like an sure. arcade. Yeah, of course. Golf. I love Top Golf. Top Golf's great. Hidden ball. Great. Cool. This episode of Go is sponsored by Freshly. Mark. Ah, they, I cut my hand. Don't have to. Uh, been more clever. Grocery store. Don't pass out, Mark. You I'm need actually, to save the call to action. You know, I'm not actually the first one in my family to cut out their hands. Actually, I was trying to help after all of my family members, extended family and everything, cut off their hands trying to prepare meals. If only we had known to celebrate the holiday with Freshly's Labor Day special and spend less time in the kitchen this fall. Down through September 17th, get $150 off your first six meals at Freshly.com slash go sports. That's $150 off at FRA. E-S-H-L-Y dot com slash G-O-S-P-O-R-T-S. Freshly dot com slash go sports for $150 off your first six orders. If you order by September 17th, Mark, we got to go and get you to the hospital. Are they here? You called an ambulance. Edinburgh. 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 I'm so bad at pronouncing stuff. It's okay. It's okay, man. You're just going to get roasted alive. In the early days, players would attempt to hit a pebble over sand dunes and around tracks using a bent stick or club. Mm-hmm. So we had men running around with sticks and hitting pebbles. We're doomed. Okay. Very simple, right? Yeah. Makes sense to me. Good. Good. I'm good. Glad good. It's great. Great. Okay. Great. During the 15th century, Scotland prepared to defend itself against an enemy, and so the nation's enthusiastic pursuit, however, of golf led many to neglect their military training. Wait. Okay, pause. You're saying that so many people were playing golf that they forgot that they were about to be invaded. No, they just neglected their training because they'd rather play golf than train. That sounds like they kind of put that on a lower priority tier below golf because they forgot about they forgot how important it was to not be stabbed. Yeah. So they wanted to play hit a ball with a stick more than they wanted to be stabbed. Apparently. Or less than the wait, no, they more than they wanted not to be stabbed. Either way, golf was banned in 1457. Of all the sports to be banned, would you have imagined golf ever being banned? 14? Yes. 1457. Absolutely. I advocate for it. You you want to you ban golf? Golf courses are a plague. Go- I mean, I... Golf courses are a plague, man. They're a plague. Bulldoze them. Now, top golf, however, <laughs> I'm all about. More top golf. <laughs> No, no, okay, all right, okay. So, 1457, it was banned. My feelings on golf, whatever. I'm ready to be convinced to love golf. I'm going to get so much subreddit hate for this episode. I know this. <laughs> <laughs> well, golf as we know it today really began in the 16th century when it began to spread across Europe with King Charles I bringing the game to England and the Mary Queen of Scots uh, introduced the game to France the when Mary she studied Queen there. Queen of Scots. 
and Mary, Queen of Scots. <laughs> you know, the Mary. The Mary, Queen of Scots. Okay, so who, uh, King who brought it to England? King Charles I. King Charles I. Is that the choppy head guy? No, that's different. That's a different guy. That's a different guy. Okay. And Mary, Queen of Scots, introduced the game to France when she studied there. Uh-huh. The term caddy is derived from the name for her French military aides, known as cadets. Mm. Cadets. Edinburgh is still one of the Edinburgh. most... Prim- Did I say it again? <laughs> just fucking with God you. God damn it. No, I'm fucking with you because you said it in this time, and I told you, I'm telling you wrong. I would never uh, lie to you. I can hear all the golfers fuming at their keyboards <laughs> on the subreddit. <laughs> no, it's reddit.com slash r slash gmfst. You can write all of your hate there for me. Go. Fantastic. So one of the premier golf courses of the day was Leith near Edinburgh. Uh, so Edinburgh? Wait, 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 wait. Edinburgh. Now Edinburgh. Don't trust that because that's not a Scot pronouncing it. You're switching to a Scot? Yeah. Uh, pronounced by a Scot. Here we go. Here we go. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. A 15 second unskippable woof. Oh, oh la, no. La, la, la. That's how you pronounce Edinburgh. <laughs> Why has it got such a long intro? Oh, <laughs> Edinburgh. 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 I thought it was Edinburgh. 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 I guess Edinburgh. I'm wrong. Edinburgh. 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 Wait, okay, hold on. That was that guy still wasn't Scottish. Hold on. We're going deep into Scotland now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's how we know. first international golf match in history in 1682 when the duke of york and george patterson represented scotland beat two english noblemen mm. with its fists golf however was not officially a sport until 1744 when the gentlemen golfers of leith formed the first club aha uh-huh. like club as in the stick club or club as in a group of people like a golf club like a group of people you just said like a golf club and that just confused me <laughs> further as in the, okay like a country club that's the word i was looking for. okay so a golf country club was formed in 17 what 1744 1744 okay we're all on the same page now and they had an annual competition with silverware prizes silverware prizes as in like silver cutlery yeah and spoons. silver cutlery spoons stuff like that because that was valuable back in the it still valuable. is now. It sounds valuable now, yeah. Sure. Silver. I'll take it. I'll take some silver. Yeah. So the rules for this new competition were drafted by Duncan Forbes. Duncan rules that Forbes. even now sound so familiar to me. Okay. You ready? Yes. If your ball comes among water or any watery filth, you are at liberty to take out your ball, bringing it behind the hazard and teeing it. You may play it with any club and allow your advisory a stroke for so getting out your ball. Okay. So you take a penalty if you ball goes in a water trap makes sense good rules good rules good rules yeah so the first ever 18 hole course was constructed at st andrews in 17 was that the only rule that he made he, he made no other rule that's the that's the first reference to golf in the historic book it's the one rule that's in there that's the rules that that's what it has he made, made no other rules there are other rules but that's just the rule that's listed here okay all right then all right all, all right okay all, all right, right. J- jacuzzi me it's their job, not your job. But you wrote this. No, I didn't write it. You didn't write it? I paraphrased it. You're stealing? I'm referencing the historic UK.com. Oh, History of Scotland. I see. I see. He's a plagiarist, everybody. I'm not a plagiarist. He's plagiarizing. I'm not a plagiarist. <laughs> anyway, the first 18 hole course uh-huh. uh, was constructed in St. Andrews in 1764 and is now recognized as the standard of game. All golf courses now are 18 holes. Okay. Cool. So wait, so that what what year was that? Seventeen fifty four. 
So in 1754, they decided... 18, or 1764. 1764, they decided that 18 holes was good enough, and they never changed it. It was not how it was. So getting into the history of golf courses, there were a bunch of different courses that had numerous different holes. Some places had 22, some had 8. There was a wide variety. And what ended up happening is that St. Andrews, which became one of the most famous courses in the history of golf, switched from having 22 holes to 18. Okay. They basically extended two of them to be longer. And so at that point, it then caught on to be the most notable number, and most courses started doing 18-hole golf. Okay. One of the golf courses in the United States when it came over to the U.S., the colonies at the time, mm-hmm. they meant to have 19 holes mm-hmm. for the 19th hole to be an opportunity for people to win their money back. Interesting. Go and on. so they ran out of space and only kept it at 18 holes. Oh, sorry, you can't win your money back. Ah, oh, man, I wish we could give you a chance to win it all back. We just don't have enough room for that 19th hole. Ah, maybe next year. Come on back. We'll let you get a chance to get your money back. That seems like exactly what it was. Yeah, sounds exactly right. According to my So. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're loaded. Come on, man. Come on, we got to finish strong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The formal golfing kilt is rarely seen outside of Scotland, but it is a combination of Scottish plaid, knee cinched shorts, and really long argyle socks. And they're still popular to this day. Yeah. That is golfing attire. That is official golfing attire. That is like as written by this Duncan doodad guy. He didn't write it, but it became the official golfing attire in Scotland. Okay, but weren't the Scots wearing that all the time anyway? <laughs> really what's the difference was like show up in your favorite clothes that you normally wear and you'll be uh, yeah that's it that's the official one yeah so the Don't oldest surviving 22 <laughs> whole former course is muscle birth links in east loth east loth gotcha so st andrews became really popular because a lot of royalty went there and considered it the best golf course okay and that's why it became the gold standard uh, it wasn't until 1552 that the first woman golfer ever played the game. It was Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots. We know yep. Mary. We love Mary. Commissioned St. Andrew's Lynx. Okay. Same um, wait, so what? What? St. Andrew's Lynx. Wait, Mary, Queen of Scots was born 1542. Yeah. You said that the, golf, the, it, the, the way they worded it was wrong. Because Mary, Queen of Scots introduced it to France and later. The way their sentence was in, in golf. France. Well, I thought it was England. Yeah, she didn't introduce it to England. King Charles the First introduced it to England. She brought it to France when she went over there to study, which was uh, later. It was in the 1500s, 1550s. Okay, got it. Okay, so all right. Okay, I'll let that slide. Have. Yeah, it wasn't until recently in the 20th out century my, that women were taken seriously in points. the sport of golf. Until when? The 20th century. The 20th century. Okay. And eventually broke the whole gentlemen only ladies forbidden, which a lot of people blame for the reason why it's called golf. What? Yeah, gentlemen's only ladies forbidden. There's no way that's true. That's there's no. There are people way. that say that. I'm, there's that no is not the way. Truth. I can that, tell yeah. you that's not the truth. Yeah. <laughs> um. So the reason it's called golf uh, is there was a version of golf called calf uh, played in America by early Dutch settlers. Uh huh. And so. It was actually in the United States where the term golf, according to the various research that I've done, where the, the term golf for the sport became its thing. Okay. I was about to say, because I was on the level of like, boys go to Jupiter, get more stupider level of like, it's that's the name. Uh, like, it's, I think there's an entire subreddit to dedicate to like, not everything's an acronym. <laughs> Correct. You know? But, yeah. okay, I get you. So women were taken more seriously in the uh, 20th century. Which a lot of things women were more taken seriously it's in the very 20th true. century. Very you know? true. Which leaves a lot of human history where women were not taken seriously and actually actively prevented from doing things. So uh, good on the past. Mm-hmm. So the rumor in Scotland, this is a rumor in Scotland apparently according to this article, okay. that the golf was an acronym. What did they know? What would, what would they know about golf? Golf was banned three times for years after it was invented because the Scottish government believed it interfered with military training. Okay. So here are some fun 20 facts about golf. Fun 20 facts about yep. golf. Modern day golf was invented in 1457 in Scotland, predating South Florida golf courses by quite some time. Of course. Yeah, because Florida wasn't even a thing back then. Apparently the first round of women's golf was played in the year 1811, Musselboro, Scotland. Isn't that clever? 
butchering that name. Muscle Bar. Muscle Bar. Muscle Beach, Scotland. Muscle Bar. Muscle Bar. Muscle Bar. Scotland. Okay. First golf balls were originally made of feathers wrapped in leather. These balls flew much further than the balls that came after, which were made out of wood, which happened in the mid 1800s. Uh huh. Uh, though Augusta is one of the most premier golf courses. Uh, nationwide, Augusta was plagued for many issues and it almost it was never built. Interesting. Augusta is the course that was intended to have a 19th hole, giving losing golfers a chance to win their money back on a quick round of double or nothing. Double or nothing? Wait, no. Okay. Because of wagers at the beginning. Okay, wait, no. Double or nothing is very different than just a chance to win back. their money back. Yeah. Now I see it. Okay. Yeah, it's probably best that that's not there. You you don't want someone after 18 rounds of trying to hit a ball in a hole that was 400 yards away to suddenly be faced with a conundrum of getting their money back on one last hit. They lose everything. So for those that are golfing out there, mm-hmm. here are some fun facts that will make you feel better about your golfing game. Okay, interesting. Almost 80% of golfers will never have a handicap under 18. I don't know what that means. <sighs> Signifies how many strokes above or below a par a golfer should be able to play. So if you have a handicap of 15, that means you're usually 15 over par for an 18-hole course. Oh, man, you're going to have to run that by me again. I do not catch that. Okay. Handicap <sighs> refers to how many strokes above or below par a golfer should be able to play. Okay. So if you have a high handicap, that's how much, on average, you're above par. What's par? Par is the average performance per course. It's what's used to dictate your score in golf. Each hole is dedicated par. Okay. So there's a par three, there's a par four, and a par five in golf. And it is predicated by architects based on the distance from the tee to the hole. Uh Okay. There's no par two? No. No par one? That's mini golf. Mini golf has par ones and par twos. Okay. Okay. All right, makes sense. Checks out. I uh, get it. So handicap. So most people won't play with a handicap of under 18, over 18? Under 18. Yeah. 80%, which means professional golfers who are at zero yeah. are insane. So, yeah, most people suck is what you're saying. So you're trying to make people feel better by telling them that they suck and they'll never get better. No, I'm telling them that they should not be so hard on themselves if they don't have a handicap under 18 because comparatively 80% of people don't get to that point. A hole in one for an average golfer is a one in twelve thousand five hundred chance. One in how much? Twelve thousand five hundred. That's not as low as I thought it would be. Right? Yeah. Because I would it's, feel I would we're feel, talking about like a par three. Uh uh-huh. okay. So closer. Yeah, I would feel like if you were standing on a golf course with a metal stick in your hand, you'd be more likely to be struck by lightning than to get a hole in one. But your statistics suggest the opposite. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Interesting. Good to know. How long do you think the longest putt in the world was? Longest putt. 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 Yes. On a green putt. Rolls on ground, not through the air. Some say it's still rolling to this day. <laughs> so, <laughs> the rumor, the truth is only whispered on the wind. You can't know it. 375 feet. No. <laughs> that's, that's no freaking It's a mind blowing 375 feet. It goes feet. in the hole after goes three, in the hole. So they just got a hole in one. Google it. Well, I mean, is that what was that the putt or did they start from the putt? Like, what is it? Okay, longest putt. Excuse me, I'm gonna bing it. Thank you very much. Oh. Let me finish the reading. Apparently, there was a new record uh, recently of yeah. 395 feet. So you were wrong. But it's the longest golf putt non-tournament. Non-tournament. Okay. I think they're referring to the putt in tournament. Okay. So wait, here is a video. I'm going to. Oh. Are you looking at the longest putt ever made on televised TV? Yeah. God, I'm not talking. There's only one reason you or any golfer struggle to make consistent flush contact. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. My handicap will never be better. All right, I'm ready. Okay. What? It's 160 feet. Oh, this is like so set up for success. Oh, yes. Oh. So... Fucking great are music. You watching, are you watching? Is that how ridiculous? How, how ridiculous. Yeah, they set that up for the Guinness Book of World Records. Okay, so that was set up for success. That wasn't actually at any stakes. I was just like, okay, yeah. we've measured this out and we've lined it up. I feel like me with enough effort could do that. But to do it for real in competition would be ludicrous, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and that was 375 feet? 375 feet. 
Okay, I believe that one over here. Golf is the only sport that was ever played on the moon. You're right. I remember that. That was a fun fact Indeed. that I heard recently. So, moving on. Moving on. You're just going to end up the, end on that one? Yeah. Well, giving that the gravitas it means? You're not going to explain? The fact that they brought golf clubs and played golf on the moon? That's the worst way to tell the story. Okay. You're going to gonna tell... I'll let you, I'm bad at storytelling, all right? No. Okay. All right. So, Take it over. All right. So, they were on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so they flew to the moon. They flew to the moon. And they, they were allowed some personal items. And you know what? Lance... Louis Armstrong. Ooh, Neil. Neil Armstrong. Mel, Nolan. Nolan North. Uncharted hero. <laughs> Brought with him. Alan. Baldwin. Alan Bartlett Shepard Jr. Alan Bartlett Shepard Jr. He's the one who played. Neil Baldwin. Armstrong didn't go to the moon. No, he did. <gasps> Neil Armstrong did go to the moon. Yes. All right, cool. Just checking. Here. Anyway. He was the first man he, to walk on the moon. He smuggled up a personal item, which was a golf ball. And he fashioned a golf club out of a flag stand. And he whacked that son bitch farther than anyone's ever hit a golf ball in their life. Actually, probably not. I don't think he made it very far. Um, but because of low gravity, it seemed pretty impressive. But he probably couldn't get that much you know, oomph to it. Anyway, that's how you tell a story. Give me some applause. Will, give me some points. <laughs> Even though we don't do that on this podcast, give me lots of points, more, more, more points. Points, points, points for me, 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 me. I'm winning this episode. Can't wait to host the next one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can go. All right, that's a brief history of golf. There will be other things that I'll insert later. That was mm-hmm. Act 1. Act 2 is before oh, the awesome. hole. Awesome. If you are going to play golf, Mark. Wait, is that the title of it? Yeah, before the hole. Give that some more weight, man. Before the hole. Before you go to a golf course, okay. there are things that you need to know. Be under- upper class, be hoity and toity at the same time. Learn that skill. <laughs> <laughs> Average parents. Uh, uh, polo. Wait. Ooh. Polo. You, you got one. You got you to gotta know proper attire. Polo shirt. Kilt. You need to know golf etiquette. Okay, golf right? etiquette. So, like, you can go to a golf course. You can rent clubs if you need clubs. Most golf courses have that ability. So we're going to talk about clubs later. But you need to understand how to handle yourself at a golf course. Handle yourself at a golf course? Are you just going to... Do people get afflicted with golf madness and they're just like... (laughs) And they just like go nuts? I don't think that's happening unless they're all... Unless there's a buffet of cocaine at the entrance of these country clubs and maybe now I know why people want to go to these places. No, but you have to be able to treat people properly because you are sharing the course with other players, other golfers. Oh, I see, yeah. So when you go to a golf course, you set up a tee time. It's the time that you need to arrive because they schedule it so that you have adequate space between their golfers to be able to walk the course. Okay. All right? So the first thing is show up early. Not on time, be a little early so that you can be ready to tee off at the time you're set. Sounds like a doctor's appointment. <laughs> yes, you have paperwork to fill out. You have caddies to deal with. You have to rent your cart. Oh, God. <laughs> Obey the cart path rules, right? Obviously, if there's a cart path, the cart goes on the path. You don't drive the cart. Why not? Some courses allow that, but it, because it damages the grass. You're telling me that they have technology for shopping carts to automatically lock if you take them too far from the parking lot, but they can't stop your car from going into the grass? The traditionals of golf, they just don't. The what of golf? Traditions. Oh, the traditions of golf. What do you say? The traditions, traditions of golf. All right. The flirtations. All right. So, key important thing, follow the cart rules. Follow the cart rules. Warm up with three balls. Don't do more. Don't cover the practice area with more than three balls. Just three? Just three. Okay. So the idea is you use your own golf balls and you don't use more than three golf balls on the putting green so that you're not overwhelming the green and make sure they are clearly marked to avoid confusion and don't put in the way of other people. Okay. Don't talk while others are hitting. It's a very obvious thing in golf. That's why the crowds get quiet before the ball is hit. Once the ball is hit, everybody erupts and cheers. Okay. If you ever watch golf. Okay. Don't talk to competitors' shots. Basically, don't say uh, they shouldn't approach it that way or speak to the ball. The idea is you're not talking to the ball. So it's like when somebody else hits the ball, you don't yell, stay out of the water. Yeah. Only they can do that to their ball. <laughs> it's like a weird taboo thing of golf. <laughs> so you can speak to your own ball. You can talk to your own ball, but you can't talk to other people's You're balls. worthless. You're a piece of shit. You're garbage. You're awful. And then other silence. Yeah, so I can ball. talk to your balls, but you can't talk to my balls. Oh, uh, wait. What? 
Why can't you talk to my balls, but I can't talk to or yours? Or wait, I can't talk to your balls. I can only talk to my balls. That's no, right. Wait, wait, I said wait, it backwards. You didn't say it backwards at all. You didn't say it right in the first place. No. You said you could talk to my balls, but I can't talk to your balls? That's unfair. <laughs> I want to talk to your balls. Ta- no, I can only talk I to my balls. I want to talk to your balls. Wait, what, what would my balls want to say to you? You're doing great. Get out there, champ. <laughs> Keep it up. You're going to get him someday. <laughs> oh, my God. You're going to drop eventually. You're going to find the car. Come on out. Who's your old little shot? <laughs> Who's hiding up there in the little ball canal? The ball canal. <laughs> what is the ball canal? What is the ball canal? Shut up. Oh, you're in the ball washer. It's okay. We'll make you know. in the ball canal. Bad balls go in the ball canal. <laughs> Anyway, can you carry on, carry on. Um, don't move or stand behind somebody on the green. Don't cast a shadow over somebody's path in which their ball would travel to the hole. On How the green. do you control that? You move. When you pull the flag, you move, and you stand in a way that doesn't cast a shadow that direction. What? It's going to go regardless. Yeah, but it, it has to do with people being able to judge and see their viewpoint to be able to tell the slope of the green and make judgments. Uh-huh. Be cautious of where you walk so you're not walking on somebody else's ball kicking a ball tearing up the course causing damage making sure you follow lost ball etiquette which basically is you have to make sure you don't spend more than three minutes trying to find a ball because a big thing is you want to make sure that you play fast this is why there's a limit of how you find a ball is because there are people behind you that want to play and if you're too slow then all of a sudden you, it creates a backup and then it's like it's not fun because then you're just standing there hoity-toity yeah hoity toity. Love hoity. Love toity. And it's the whole idea is ready golf. When it's your turn to hit, be ready, figure it out, and then hit the ball. Okay. So don't be on the phone. Don't be distracted. Understand the rules. Always yell four if it goes towards a person. Really? Yes. Is that a thing? That's a thing. Mm. It's to warn them that it's coming at them. Mm. I thought that was an F. I thought that nope. was just a joke. It's F O R E, not F O U R. I knew that. Who didn't know that? Who wouldn't have known that? Everyone knows four, five. (laughs) In addition to those things, there are other things that you have to do golf etiquette-wise to maintain the course. Uh If you have a created divot, which is when a piece of grass gets chunked out of the ground, you replace the divot and stomp it down. Mm -hmm. That's just general golf etiquette. It'll eventually dry out, but it makes it so that the course isn't terrible for another person who hits the ball behind you. Okay. Or it's secretly terrible. It's secretly terrible, yeah. Yeah. Because they're going to slip on it anyway. The other thing is fixing your ball dents in the green. So if you chip a ball and it lands on the green, you're going to create a dent. And there's a tool that looks like a little tuning fork that you scoop underneath and you lift it up going in a circular pattern to lift that dent and remove ball dents from the green. Oh, interesting. You have to do that? Yes. I guess it's because maintenance wouldn't know if you did that. So it's like you have to do it right then and there or else no one's going to know. It's Correct, going to because it affects the person behind you. Uh, it's almost like golf is a too high maintenance sport that requires a lot too much for uh, the the watering of the grass and the natural upkeep of this uh, really ecologically disastrous uh, area of land. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 We're not going to get any PGA sponsorships, are we? <laughs> so do you want to know where four came from? No, I, I think, wait, okay, tell me. Yeah, where's four? So four caddies were originally in charge of watching the golf balls and indicated where the balls landed because it was a lot harder to keep track of back in the day. They didn't have the microchips to keep track of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, you would let the four caddy know when the ball is being struck. You would yell out four caddy. Eventually, the caddy part was dropped, leaving just the four because the caddy became the assist. Another one done for today. Thanks for everyone joining. Thanks for using your vicarious point to making my workout a bit extra longer and more worth it. Chat is coming at the end to make sure I'm doing my push-ups properly, getting in the way, making sure my form isn't uh, compromised no matter what the situation. Uh, let's see, where can I not see my mouse? There it is. But yeah, anyway, those are my lazy Mondays, very simple exercises. Started off first, don't really feel like doing it, but you know, once you get into it, that's when you start to, you know, well, I don't know if you know or not, but 
you get to a point where you want to make every workout worth it if you do get into it at least push yourself a bit extra in some way I won't say I do that every time sometimes I just do it I mean sometimes I just do the workout for the sake of doing the workout because I know I'll feel like um, if I don't the next day I'll be like damn I'm now one day behind in the rest of my life to where I could be um, that's how I view when it comes to being consistent with these sort of, this sort of training um, I can make lunch now, chill, play some TFT, I'll see you guys Wednesday morning, work doesn't need me, we got this Thursday off, to um, commemorate, the, no commemorate can't be the word, that's too, what is it, that's too um, positive I guess. Queen's unfortunate passing. Uh, it was procedural that, well, a lawyer told me it's procedural that they, that they were going to choose a day that we all get to have off, which is this Thursday. Pain in the ass for some employers, but it is what it is. I just got to get that out of the way. I have noodles and eggs today for lunch. Not too much in my fridge. We weren't here this weekend. Could not stock up. But you do what you can do. Back to 10. Zero. No shit's given. 